Jonathan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, David. Thanks for having me. Where are you uh, connecting from today? I'm down here in Scottsdale, Arizona. I'm a uh, senior partner with Frazier, Ryan, Goldberg, and Arnold. We're uh, uh, the largest trust in the state firm in Arizona. I'm a senior okay. partner focusing on advanced estate planning for large, complex estates. <laughs> awesome. So I, I know you went to uh, Arizona undergrad. Are you from Arizona? Yeah, I grew up here all 18 years of my life in the same house. I've got a, a nice- You're like the only family. one. You're the only- That's right. A Arizona lot of transplants. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I went to U of A, studied finance accounting, and then I went up to law school in San Francisco. I was I lived in the heart of the city for about 11 years and met my wife. And then we, we came back to raise kids here in 2015. So I've got a, a six-year-old Jack and a three-year-old Rose. That's uh, that's awesome. And I love Scottsdale. I go there every January for the Barrett Jackson auctions. Oh, I always man. enjoy being there. Well, you probably saw my bio. I, I am a car enthusiast, collector, a track driver. So, Oh, yeah. I didn't realize. I didn't realize that. What yeah. uh, what's, do you have? A, I know cars can't or like kids. You can't really have a favorite. But if you did have a favorite, what's your favorite? <laughs> Election. I've got three. I, I over the years I've had a lot of cars, um, but I primarily drive and collect uh, BMWs, Porsches, and Ferraris. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Drivers' you have cars. Two, you have drivers a, cars. Do you have a two thousand two? Uh, no, I don't have a classic two thousand two. Mostly modern stuff. Um, okay. All the modern sort of M twos, M threes. I I I, usually, I only have about three or four cars at a time, unlike a lot of guys, but. Um, I swap them every six, 12 months. I'm, I'm changing them in and out. Understood. So I drove a Tesla Model S Plaid three years ago. Yeah, and, my, and my enthusiasm for gasoline engines just kind of went away. I always said I was brand agnostic and powertrain agnostic. So <laughs> at one point I had the Tesla Model S Plaid. I had a Camaro ZL1 convertible. Oh, yeah. Six speed. And I had a Jeep diesel Grand Cherokee, which I had a special order to get the three liter diesel. So I'm like three brands, three propulsion types. But uh, I'm down to actually one vehicle for the first time in a long time, uh, a Rivian R1S, which is by oh, yeah. far the best vehicle I've ever owned. Is that My biggest right? concern yeah. with them is just whether they're going to be in business in another year or not. Right, right. It's like Fisker. They keep coming in and out. And I just saw news today. They're not doing well. Uh, I yeah, I've never driven the Plaid, although my one of my Ferraris is faster than that Plaid, believe it or not. So, oh, wow. The line. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Well, we'll have to talk about it more and off. Be sure to look you up next January in Scottsdale. Please do. So we're going to talk about estate planning. And uh, I, have, I'm, I know enough to be dangerous. Uh, my listeners are you know, my listeners and clients are privately held business owners uh, with enterprise values between probably 10 and $100 million. Uh, the business represents the majority of their net worth. And I understand there's some things going on that have some deadlines that create some urgency. So why don't we get into it? Um, so just start wherever you want to. Sure. Yeah, so so those those clients are really my clients, mid market business owners, uh, for the most part. My my practice, my again, we call it advanced estate planning. What that means is the net worth, including business real estate, uh, is high enough to warrant uh, planning beyond just the will and living trust, powers of attorney, the the core estate documents that that everybody needs. Once you get to a certain wealth level or income level, then you need to start focusing on advanced planning, which encompasses, we joke, all the acronym planning, all of those acronyms you hear about um, uh, in the estate, estate and gift world. So, yeah, yeah. So, so for mid market business owners right now, um, you know, generally, you know, you're looking at $10 million minimum enterprise value. That warrants a good look at estate planning. Uh, we have the, the urgency at this point. It's not as urgent quite yet, which is the time to catch us because there's a limited number of Jonathan Morrison's in any state other than, you know, California. I, I practiced up in Silicon Valley for about a decade. 
uh, or Manhattan. You know, there's about 50 of us, but in most of the smaller, any other state, there's maybe five, maybe that really, you know, do this day in and day out. It's like a hard surgeon. I've done this five over 500 times, okay. um, it's transactions, design, implementation, and you've got to have at least 200, 250 reps before you really know what you're doing, mastering the, the vehicles mm -hmm. themselves, uh, and then being able to distill it and communicate it to clients uh, and be able to then get it done very quickly without, uh, you know, business owners, they, they hate this stuff. This is complex. It's yeah. annoying. They don't want to talk about death and taxes. They want to just operate their business. So yeah. I've gotten to a very unique model um, that we can get into in a little bit. I wanted to focus on the urgency, but a very unique model um, that's really custom tailored for busy business owners that need to get this done quickly with high quality uh, and, and low stress. Okay, uh, but the urgency. Back to the urgency. So, I think uh, most of the of your uh, listeners probably know that the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, the Trump tax reform, is going to expire or sunset as of January 1st, 2026. Okay, uh, less than two years. Yeah, yeah. So you know, year and nine months, and um. As part of that, in the estate planning world, really the biggest change, perhaps the only significant change, <clears throat> is the reduction in the federal gift and estate tax exemptions. Okay, what are those? Well, right now, there are all-time highs, okay? Right now, you can gift during life or at death uh, up to 13 and a half million if you're single, without any gift or estate tax, or if you're married, you can give to about 27.2 um, during life or at death. And above that, if you go over that, uh, there's a 40% gift tax if you gift during life or at death, a 40% uh, inheritance tax paid by your children. And so that exemption amount is scheduled to be cut in half on January 1st, 2026. We don't know quite yet the number. It's probably gonna be somewhere around 7 million for a single and 14 million for a married couple. So okay. significant amount less that you can gift to individuals, children, grandchildren, anybody else um, uh, in 2026, unless you lock in that exemption before then. So I'll pause. And so let me just interject yeah, please. one second. So just understanding numbers that I do, if you consider a population one, everybody with an estate over 27 million is group one. And group two is everybody between 13 and 27 million of estate size or 14 million. I'm guessing that group two is probably way larger than group one. Even though the on an absolute dollars, there's folks, you know, from you know. 26 million all the way to you know billions but i'm guessing and so is that is that assumption correct that that a multiple of people who needed to worry about exceeding the exemption the those number of people are now being multiplied is that right yeah yeah once exemptions go down you've got a lot of people now that have to have to worry about estate taxes so in 2026 there's gonna be a lot more people that need my services um, but between now and 26, it's really, you know, if I had to pick a number, it's somebody that either already has about 10, $15 million or more because uh -huh. you're double, you know, doubling every 10 years, assuming the rule of 72. Yeah. Um, those people need to look at this planning, but more importantly, perhaps are a lot of your listeners. These are business owners. And their businesses are on fire. They're just going out. Their EBIT is, you know, jumping every year. Multiples might be getting higher. And so between now and their death, you know, they might be in their 40s, 50s, 60s. They got a long life expectancy. They're likely going to have a lot of them uh, over $100 million net worth at death. That's when you have to measure this tax. You file a federal estate tax return within nine months after death. Um 
And the government wants valuations and they want to see what you're worth. And there's a 40% tax imposed at that time. Um, and, and that's due within nine months. There's a huge check that gets written. The good news is um, there, a, a Harvard professor famously said, the federal estate tax is optional as long as you plan for it. I don't care what you're worth. If you've got 20, maybe 30 years to live, unless you're like over a half billion dollars of net worth, I can usually wipe out the federal estate tax through proactive planning. And I've got, like I said, a finance and accounting background. I've got financial models that I run free of charge, all, all up front to show you. Um, like I just did one for a hundred million dollar business owner. And it showed that, you know, he had about 20 million of other assets, but it showed, and he, he was 55. It showed that if he was willing to transfer 60% of his business into the special kind of trust, that we were going to wipe out his $200 million projected estate tax in 30 years. It was going to go to zero. And he had totally stabilized cash flow and liquidity uh, between now and year 30. So the name of the game is to figure out how much do we need to transfer? And you got to run financial models. Most attorneys don't do that. Um, but for a business owner, there's so much that we can do because we can value the business at uh, less attractive values at the time of gift. Uh, number one. So, so valuations in the tax code say the valuation firm has to look at it from a discounted cash flow perspective, not a strategic buyer perspective. I just mm -hmm. had a $600 million company that just sold a year ago. We got it valued at $80 million because it wasn't valued from a strategic buyer standpoint. So, right. This was so, when you, you got a bunch of, if you come to me and you're 80 and you've got $100 million of cash, it's a lot harder to wipe out the state tax versus. A business owner that's got a EBIT of five, 10 million, but they're in their 50s, you know, we can we can transfer some of that business out and rely on a number of other mechanisms to wipe out that estate tax and get asset protection while they're living uh, very okay. easily. And they keep total control over their estate if you do it right and, and the business. So I'm intrigued. Uh, tell me more. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll tell you. The exemptions going away when you run the financial models out 30 or 40 years for a lot of your business owner clients. Okay. There's the exemption is prompting a lot of this planning and I'll, I'll explain one of the reason, but the exemptions are going down. It's use it or lose it. Okay. So let's say you've got a, a nice boring uh, balance sheet, $50 million stocks and bonds. Okay. Yeah. Single, single guy. That guy should definitely gift his $13.6 million exemption before 2026. We'll talk about, you know, just you don't just gift it to kids. We've got, I've got a special vehicle um, that's, that I've done over 200 of these without an audit. It's making the cover of the state, National State Planning Journal in May. So you've got these, a trust receptacle. If you do it right, that client could gift 13 million and keep total control and access um, while they're living. Again, if you if you know what you're doing and that tr irrevocable trust is designed from the outset correctly, which a lot of them aren't, I call that the optimized gift trust. So again, that's a boring $50 million cash, stocks, bonds. So business owners, here's, we got the exemptions going away. That's prompting some of this. Here's the more important impetus is for uh, reasons to act. Um, number one, the business is keep keeps going up in value. We want to freeze that appreciation on that business, gift it out of the estate. So all that all that post gift trans appreciation on the business uh, when they sell, all of that is soaked up off balance sheet. You don't your clients, my clients are too wealthy, and we don't want them getting any wealthier because there there's creditor and lawsuit exposure while they're living. And then at death, the government takes the estate tax. So the sooner we can get a client before the business takes off, transfer some or all of that business to that special type of optimized gift trust, get them all the control, but start building wealth off balance sheet. Rockefeller famously said, you want to own nothing but control everything. Mm -hmm. If you do it right, they won't own that business anymore, but... They can control and access that gift trust in so many different ways. Uh, the IRS has lost 
so many cases in the last several decades that allows us to pack those optimized gift trusts with so many controls. So, so again, number one urgency um, is really the fact that a lot of business owners are going to continue to grow their business and we want to shelter it. The second major reason is uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of legislative risk right now. I mentioned how over the last 40, 50 years, the IRS has lost, pretty much been on the losing end of all the cases in estate and gift. Um, we didn't, we, we couldn't, we, in the old days, you couldn't pack that much control on these gift trusts. The IRS has lost cases or given up or acquiesced in rulings that now, if you do it right, these gift trusts that you put in your business or other assets into, there's pretty much nothing we can't, it's technically irrevocable if you don't own it anymore. But if you do it right, like you'll see in my paper, my materials for the, the gift trust, they have so much control. In 2021, they almost patched it. Remember that building back better bill? Which yeah. Lots of business owners were worried about. Well, there was a little piece nobody was paying attention to except for us in the state and gift tax, eight pages. It would have killed all of these flexible trusts that we use. Any quote grantor trust would have been abolished unless you got it funded before Biden signed it into law. So I did 160 deals, uh, $3 billion of gifts, uh, those uh, 18 month period. It didn't pass because remember there were two senators, Manchin and Cinema, that didn't vote for it. Right. right. But with, and this is covered in my paper in the journal, um, they could, there's always rumors they could take another stab at trying to kill off grantor trusts. Uh, we also have interest rates that could keep going up. A lot of what we do leverages those interest rates. So there's a lot of headwind in the near future, next few years, perhaps, and, and the lowered exemptions. This is sort of the golden age of estate planning that's kind of fleeting because the, they're trying to kill off the trust. The exemptions are going down. Interest rates are going up. If you're a business owner, this is the time to act if you haven't already. Okay. Yeah, and because I'm assuming since you're talking about valuations being, you know, discounted cash flow, that these higher interest rates are creating bigger discounts. That's right? part of it. Uh, I mean, the major reason for interest rates being relevant is you can gift assets to these types of trusts, but you're limited by that exemption, 13 million. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's another way you can actually get up to 10 times that amount in these trusts. And that's a so-called sale to a defective grantor trust. What does that mean? It means I put $13 million of cash in this trust. I can then actually transfer another 100, uh, 130 million, 10 times in exchange for a note back to me, okay? okay? That note, the IRS requires a minimum interest rate. Pretty much tracks the 10-year treasury. So <clears throat> the higher the interest rate, the more this trust is feeding back into your your name, your taxable estate. So we want low interest rates. We want to be able to, I see. You know, a couple of years ago, we were lending so much money at the 1% interest only 30 year fixed. Right. The gift trust is arbitraging and we froze that client's estate at that note value with 1%. So there's other strategies like grats and clats that are interest rate dependent, but bottom line, yeah, it's one headwind is the interest rate um, going up. Okay. So why don't we talk a little bit, uh, so we talked about sort of the urgencies, business value going up, uh, these cool trusts that we've been using for decades might be go might be gone soon if you don't get it done. You'd be right. grandfathered in under everything we've ever seen. So this is the time to act. Um, now let's talk about the importance of that gift trust being flexible, okay? Um, I developed this thing in 2020. I call it, I just, I call it an optimized gift trust, okay? It's, if you know any about gift trust, and many of your, your uh, podcast listeners have probably heard of uh, idgits or generation skipping trusts or um, dynasty trusts or slats, all these things. All those things basically mean is, hey, there are features of a gift trust that give you either tax benefits or retain control. So, you know, what if you create a gift trust and you just put all those things into one? I could call it a hybrid. It's 
nothing new. If you go to Manhattan or Silicon Valley, they're not going to call it an optimized gift trust. It's just how we do it there. But you go to smaller markets like where I live, uh, Phoenix, or you know, it, it isn't even a small market. But there's there's attorneys that aren't just getting they're just not getting enough repetitions over the years. Mm -hmm. So these gift trusts, a lot of the ones that I review locally, for example. Um, just don't have the maximum strings and controls that your business owner client can have if they're gifting. And it's a big deal because if you run the financial model, the majority of wealth is going to be in these gift trusts. If they're not done from the outset, you might never be able to get that money back or change the beneficiaries or access it or do many, lots of different things. And I clean up bad irrevocable gift trusts all the time. So in 2020, I developed this thing called the Optimized Gift Trust, um, three-page uh, out overview. Uh, I got a seven-page frequently asked questions. I try to productize things. I, you know, I've done this 500 times. I try to take all this complexity and put it into a nice, easy-to-go package for business owners that are way too busy. Um, and so this gift trust has all the bells and whistles. Uh, and I mentioned I, I was just asked by the National Estate Planning Journal, the top journal in my field. I made the cover back in 2020 with a different product. Uh, this one in May 2024, in a couple months, uh, will be on the cover, the full legal, you know, all the legal citations. It was peer reviewed, everything. There wasn't a single change. Um, so it all checks out. Uh, never been audited. We've It's audit defensible as well. We've got a We've got an army of lawyers here at this firm, about uh, three or four of them that, that are I, former IRS trial attorneys that can defend it. But mm -hmm. um, my point is, is these business owners need to make transfers here soon. And you better darn have your gift trust within that 60 page document. It's irrevocable, meaning you can't change it, the terms of that trust once it's done. And so if it's not optimized from the outset, um, that can be a big problem. Um, so yeah, you really want a flexible, accessible trust. If you do it right, the business owner, literally there's no downside. They can, we can get it back in four or five different access points, make changes, especially if they're married, you can include slot powers, spousal life access, trust powers, which, which give the marital unit even more control. So, uh, so that that's the again number one the, the urgency to act and the number two making sure you've got a strong gift trust to receive that gift and and make changes down the road. Okay. That yeah, that sounds that makes a lot of sense. So, um, could you give us uh, maybe a, a case study example, like anonymously? Sure. Uh, you yeah, know, just to, to kind of give some color to some of this. Yeah, sure. So, um, well, I mentioned I have um, a unique process, and that as part of that, uh, what I do is I prepare. I built out this financial model. Okay, if you go to any of the top, I mean, I, I haven't found a bank yet that I really like their financial model. Even the top banks in the world. They've got these financial models that will illustrate what it looks like to gift into these gift trusts. And they'll run it out 30 years and um, it'll show you cash flows and tax savings. But mo all the models I've reviewed are really developed by financial people, not estate and gift attorneys, attorneys like me. Okay. So about 10 years ago, I developed this bespoke um, model. It's Excel based. Um, and <clears throat> we can input all the, you know, I, I basically have a custom tailor to what I like to do. So we put in spending, you know, assets, asset performance, business assumptions, how long you're gonna live, all of these things. And it's, you put in, really it's determined, determined the, the goal of this is to output for me how much does my client need to gift into this gift trust to cause it so that they, <laughs> I joke, die poor. We want them poor, mm -hmm. poorer during life. If you get sued, you don't own it anymore. But that, that objective, the, the competing objective is we don't want them to put too much in the gift trust because 
The IRS doesn't like if you're poking and prodding and grabbing the assets out of there. Ideally, they'll never need to touch it, okay? Mm -hmm. We've got all these access points that they need to get it back in emergency, great. But I want to make sure that they haven't given it away too much. They've still got plenty of liquidity, stabilized cash, uh, net of expenses, net of taxes, net of spending uh, over here. So that's the output. So you wanted a case study. You wanted a case study. So uh, I just did one of the I have a sample model um, that's client uh, business owner. He's got about $5 million of liquid assets, cash, stocks, bonds. Um, he's got $10 million of investment real estate. Yeah, he's got a $5 million home. So, you know, 20, 25 million. But the bulk of his net worth uh, is in the business. It doesn't have to be that way. A lot of business owners have a lot less. Mm -hmm. um, but the assumption was it was he could sell the business to a strategic for $100 million in two years. Okay. We went and got a valuation, <clears throat> looked at the company from the worst possible lens, defensively low, top valuation firm, uh, looked at EBITDA, looked at the market, um, and and also applied minority interest valuation discounts. So a lot of times we're gifting minority interest in the company to the gift trust. Okay. You get further discounts. Bottom line, it's not atypical for a $100 million company to be valued at maybe $20 million when all the discounts are applied. Okay, enterprise okay. discount, maybe down to 40, and then maybe another you know, 40, 50% discount on that for minority interest. <clears throat> so this, so we put all put all this in the model. You're spending 750 grand a year and you got inflation, inflation adjustments and everything. But the model showed that if he gifted 60% of the shares in his company to this special gift trust, that <clears throat> over the next 30 years, rather than his estate just growing, I think he has about... 500 million in 30 years on these assumptions, causing a $200 million inheritance tax at death, 40% mm -hmm. of 500. Mm -hmm. By gifting that 60% interest, we froze his estate tax, I think about $15 million. So he always had about $50 million in his hands. But all, but because he had that sweet spot, all of that future value, even when the business is sold and reinvested, we froze his net worth at about 50 over here. And effectively, because of all the thing that's going on, the gift trust was worth $450 million at death. That gift trust is not only exempt from 40% of state tax at, at his death, but it's generation skipping, meaning it's totally out of, permanently out of the federal 40% gift and inheritance tax for generations, generations. In Arizona, we got 500 years depends on which state you live in or you set it up. But I mean, we wiped out $200 million state tax and it made sure he had plenty of money to spend. Totally accessible gift trust if he ever needed to access it. Controlled the business units that he gifted away. Um, we can still make changes to beneficiaries or give it all to charity or some of the charity down the road. He could borrow from the gift trust, all sorts of stuff. His wife could take distributions out. So it's, that's, that's a great, I mean, this is a very common example of the power that uh, state attorneys that know what they're doing uh, can can do for a business owner for rel relatively small fees, very small fees compared to that type of savings. Sure. And I, and I presume that's where the word optimized comes in because you're talking about yeah. that modeling and you're kind of trying to find that sweet spot of him having enough cash flow, enough control, right? Is that kind of what the optimization means? You, you hit it on the, on the head. There's two optimizations, okay? The first is making sure that gift trust has optimized his retain and control, right? We've given as much as the IRS case law allows with minimal risk. We're not going over the edge. And there's yeah. a ton of stuff we can pack in there. So if he needs to do anything with the gift trust, we've got that optimized. And then <clears throat> the second thing is, making sure exactly that the, the transfer into trust, I call it the funding design, how it's transferred. Is it a gift? Is it a sale for a note back? Are we loaning additional assets? Modeling that out so that the funding design is optimized. 
there's a I've got a I have to put a disclaimer in here. I'd say 95% of trusts and designs that I review, probably less than that, are totally optimized. There's a lot of attorneys out there that are going to seminars, they're reading about certain gift trusts, especially SLATs, spousal life access trusts. And they think they can get on their computer and go on the pro some document program and start pushing buttons and making it work. This is dangerous. You, I didn't know what I was doing until probably about 200 transactions. Okay. I, I trained sure. under, I was at the top firm in Silicon Valley, took public Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Tesla. And I was training for 10 hard years before I knew what I was doing. Um, so making sure that your gift trust is prepared by somebody that specializes in the field, has done it many, many times, and not just the trust being done right. Maybe you can get those buttons right if you're pushing them. But <clears throat> the funding design is much more complex. And I don't know many attorneys that can the no numbers backwards and forwards. They usually rely on the financial advisor. Financial advisor usually doesn't really know how to apply their financial modeling to estate planning. It's just it's a concern. So, uh, so anyways, that, that's enough of that disclaimer. But yeah, you got to optimize the trust and the defending design, which is my journal article, 15 pages, goes into everything I'm talking about in, in detail. No, thank you very much. That is very helpful. And we'll want to link some of that information that I'll get from you uh, after we finish recording. Excellent. Yeah, happy to. Um, I'll share the overview, frequently asked questions. And I'm not sure if I can share that journal article. It's in the final peer review draft. But once that comes out, i um, happy to share that over. That, that sounds great. What else do we need to talk about? Hmm. Again, focusing on that business owner. Yeah. That, you know, the bulk of their wealth is in uh, the business. Now, what about, so is it safe to assume that say somebody has a, you know, they have a business that's worth $5 million and, you know, they have another three or $4 million outside the business. They don't anticipate huge growth in the business. Uh, do, do they have a need for this planning? Yeah, I think, I mean, again, it depends on what the value of the business, you know, if you, if you pass away, the IRS is going to require a valuation of that company uh, within nine months. If you're over the exemption amount, again, in a couple of years here, you know, the exemption right. is 7 million for single, 14 for a married. So, yeah, I think if you're if the value of the company and all the assets are 10 million or above, I think it's at least worth the conversation. There's a different design for a $15 million uh, individual or couple than a hundred million dollar. You might, for right. example, you know, a lot of 20 or $30 million cases I come across, not all business owners, but like the design there is you want to consume one spouse's exemption. You don't need, you know, before, and then preserve the second spouse's exemption. So gift out of that spouse's exemption, lock that in at least before 26. Right. Got partial forfeiture of the other spouse. There's lots of things you can do, but, but yeah, I, I think I'd say it's probably closer to, you know, 15 million is kind of net worth level all in real estate business. If you died tomorrow. It's worth talking about and saying, running it, you know, and seeing if it's worthwhile. Yeah. And because like you're saying, one of the biggest risks of that scenario is let's say this hypothetical person is married and you know, let's say the exemptions drop in 27 to what you're thinking they will be. Yeah. But let's just say though, that the year before, and then let's say he dies in 2029, but let's say the year before he dies, he just has a huge year, a record year. Yeah. And then the business gets valued within nine months of when he dies. Uh, he might have a surprise valuation that, right? So, so like that's another piece of it too, is you're locking in this valuation at the yes. most conservative value. And it sounds like post-mortem, some of those uh, tools 
maybe limited. They're gone. Yeah. When, once somebody passes away, we can't do any estate tax savings for them. Yeah. But you're right. Locking and low valuation. So, for example, I just <laughs> I represented uh, these famous restaurateurs and, you know, definitely a couple hundred million dollars of restaurants. 2020 happened and all the restaurants shut down. And I remember I was just, I tried so hard. They ended up not pulling a trigger. I said, look, guys, I said, your value of your restaurants because of the COVID pandemic is like probably 20% of what it used to be. Nobody knows sure. how long this pandemic's going. I said, let's get these restaurants transferred out of your state at a depressed gift value. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we got to file, the only filing for this is a one-time gift federal gift tax return said, Hey, here's our valuation IRS. Here's what we transferred. There's only, there's a less than 1% reported audit rate on those. Okay. The IRS has three years to challenge the value. If they don't, which they never do, then you've cleansed that gift and that valuation at death right now, there's almost a hundred percent chance that an estate tax auditor, at least somebody's going to look at it from the IRS. They might not do a full, full audit, but somebody's going to look at it. So if you've got attractive valuations, especially if it's depressed year on your, your EBITDA for whatever reason, that's the year to get it in. It's like buying low, sell, buying low, selling high. Similar, you want to transfer that into the gift trust when it's low, use a minimal amount of your exemption and soak up all that post-gift appreciation out of the estate. The, the other Two more things. Yeah, life insurance is a big, big deal. It's not something I sell. But for business owners, it's just good estate planning. Yeah, um, just to have the liquidity to pay the estate tax. Exactly. Yeah, because you know there is there's a section of the tax code, the good news that says if you pass away and more than thirty five percent of your estate is trapped up in a business or even a, if you're a real estate uh, professional, real estate business can qualify, and you get to pay that estate tax actually over up to fifteen years. Okay. Okay. Section sixty one sixty six. Here's the problem. The IRS wants liens. You've got now IRS as your partner, or you died and your partner's now the IRS, liens and all the headache. I see. So here's what I tell clients. I say, look, <clears throat> I can, if you live long enough, I can almost certainly wipe out your estate tax without you ever having to, you know, lose control or give up a penny, essentially. But until I can, if you've already, you come to me, you've got $100 million, say, well, or a business worth 100 See, it's going to take some, there's some time component. Can't immediately wipe out the death tax, but mm -hmm. there's a time component. Usually by like year 10, 20, we're getting close. So buy a big old policy of life insurance. We get it into the gift trust, the uh, irrevocable life insurance trust or an islet. At least the death benefit isn't getting included in the estate. And then <clears throat> if you get a flexible life insurance policy, you can always scale down that death benefit. As, as my as I'm doing my job over the years and the estate tax sure, is getting sure. short, you can reduce that death benefit. But if you have an unexpected death, at least we've got some liquidity to get the IRS out of the way and you don't got liens on the business for 15 yeah. years, right? Yeah. So that's critical. Um, we've, we've got a few more minutes. Unless you have something else, I, I wanted to talk no. about my process. Right. Yeah. So... Again, this is very unique. <laughs> Attorney, I, attorneys drive me as crazy as they drive most business owners. Okay? <laughs> What's the complaints about? In fact, in 20 minutes, I'm going to present to all my attorneys here at the firm on best practices, on efficiencies and productivity, because I've got all these systems down. Um, but what, what are the knocks, right? Attorneys, they never get back to you. They're, they don't use email. Hourly billing, some range, you know, I remember a, a famous quote, you know, some attorney said, oh, it's going to cost, I don't know, five to $10,000. And it was a construction a builder. And I remember the builder said, wait a second, I can quote a $20 million project down to the penny and you can't quote a darn estate plan. You give me a five to $10,000 range. So anyways, hourly billings, all this um, talking over their head. It takes five meetings to get anything done. It's complicated. Um, so I solved all this a few, five years ago, um, I went to this, just kind of revamp the whole model. And <clears throat> I do a, no, a number of things. Um, first, I don't have any junior lawyers, okay? You think it's hard to hire in your industry and your for your business? 
try the neurosurgery of the law in a small right. market. It's it's impossible to even find senior lawyers that are really good at this at, the, at advanced planning. So it was driving me crazy. You know, I quality control and delays. Where who's on which client? Stuff comes back. It's a mess. I got to redline it. Um, loss of control, lock of lock of lock of control, caseload control, and quality control and delay. So I'd only ju no junior lawyers. I take a limited number of cases. I charge a premium fee, but I joke that you buy my brain. You don't buy some third year lawyer's brain. Uh, number two, it's a flat fee model. I've got a scheduled flat fee model. Uh, almost always tax deductible against the business uh, income as a legal expense. Right. Getting a 40, 50% discount right off the bat. Um, one time fee. So we go through this process and we get it all set up. Most people, they need a will trust update. They need the optimized gift trust. Maybe they need this other charitable trust for income tax planning. But if you do it right, the structure is simple um, and and it's easy to operate. At the very end of my process, I've got an instruction manual, I call it. It says, hey, the lawyer set all this stuff up, but here's how you operate it. Copy the CPA, copy the investment uh, advisor. Here's how, in six pages, here's, how, here's what you did. Here's how to operate it. Let's have annual reviews. I don't charge for annual reviews. I don't charge for phone calls after they've done it. I, they want to add some at, minor assets in there. We don't charge for that. Um, it, you get a one-time fee and you'll get all these hourly billings. Um, and then the third thing that I do that's pretty unique, although probably in the next two years, I'll, I'm buried, so I don't know if I can do this part always. But right now, when it's slow slow years, we don't have a tax law change. If I'm engaged, if I have a conversation with a new prospective client, 30, 45 minute call. I then get all the information I need. I work for free initially. Come back about four weeks later with a full roadmap recommendation memo, 10 pages. It says, here's, here's your objectives. Here's your background. Here's exactly what I would do if I were you. Include a diagram, include those financial projections. I give it all away for free. It takes me maybe eight, 10 hours. Um, but because I've got all the processes, it, it, it usually takes other lawyers a lot longer than that. And then it has the fee quote, one-time fee. I'd say three out of four times people say, maybe more than that. People say, I like this lawyer. I see, I've gotten to know him. I've gotten to see his work. I like the plan. And here's what it costs, one-time fee. I'm, he's not relying on junior lawyers. He's going to get this done in three phone calls, maybe two. Um, and so they like the, pro they get to sample the process without having to pay 20 grand in hourly fees. Find out this lawyer isn't really doing brilliant. what it is. Yeah, lots yeah, of that things. Is yeah. Yeah. Really. And the thing is, even if they took your roadmap to another attorney, unless they had your level of expertise, they really couldn't execute on that roadmap anyway. Right. Yeah, that's the thing. I, I joke sometimes I say I can give you the key to, your, to my Ferrari, but I don't know. It doesn't mean you can drive it. Right. You could turn it on, but you're not going to know how to really use it. So that happens every now and then. And I'm, I'm, I'm straight up. I say, look, if you shop this around, you can probably get it for half a third of the cost, but you're mm -hmm. going to get a junior lawyer. You're not going to get somebody that's done this 500 times top firm in Silicon Valley. You know, you're not going to get it in two or three. I mean, you just, I'm doing right. all the document drafting over time. I mean, you, you're iron sharpens iron. You get those reps. Senior lawyers are lazy. They're just sourcing business and sending it down the hall to a junior. And they don't know what's going on in those documents. And if it's not done right, you're building a house for all of your wealth. Four hundred fifty right. million dollars. My client projected. If that trust isn't done right, you know we have client like a lot of our client myself. Like we'll spend twenty thirty grand on a kitchen remodel. Right. But I have clients that say, "Wait a second, I don't want to spend fifty, a hundred grand on this. I can get it done for fifteen or twenty five. And I'm like, "Do you know how important this is? This is not the area to skimp. Like, uh, you want experienced lawyer drafting because you can't change it later if it's not done right. You, yeah. You know, well, and then the fact that it's it's a it's an upfront payment, like you know, that, that they get the annual reviews for, you know, right? No ongoing billings, and you're working. Yeah, with, there's you huge know. value. Uh, it's to unique. That as well. it's, it shouldn't be unique in my industry. It, it it sounds like you know, in most industries they've come a long way. The law is still behind the times, at least in the state. Yeah, program. the law and in the accounting profession too. Yeah, right. Uh, so uh, the other thing that I think people don't realize is that is that folks really don't need a pure custom estate plan. My sense is 
they need a some standardized plan, right? Because I'm guessing that all of those 500 estate plans you've done fall into a small number of categories, fact patterns, right? It's I just, agree. There's probably about five fact patterns. And you've done enough. You know, this is this bucket. This is right. the design. And then when you go through, the, there is customization, right? Once we go through, I sent out the draft gift trust. It goes out with an explanatory memo. There's 15, 20 custom decision points usually that we go through. So there's customization, but generally you're right. The design, the funding design, most of the time goes in four or five buckets. Well, and it's the same reason that, you know, for better, for worse, a Toyota objectively has better big build quality than a hand-built exotic car because <laughs> of the, uh, the repetitions. Of yeah, making yeah, and the standardizations and the perfection and, you know, Six Sigma, you know, defect measurement. And now so I can appreciate the value of starting with a framework that's proven. I mean, even just something as simple as, as you know, when you're if you start with standardized documents that you can search and replace, you know, stuff with, you're far better off than just starting with a clean slate or something that's very different than what you're going to end up. End you're up right. With. Yeah. I mean, my process, my documents, I put hundreds of hours into and I'm constant. That's again, a benefit of doing it myself and not relying on junior lawyers is I'm constantly tweaking my forms you know, at least once a week. Yeah. There's something in a memo or something. Like, ah, I'm going to add this or change this. And so you're constantly improving it. That happens at a lot of law firms, but again, it's usually junior lawyers that are updating yeah. forms and doing all that. And you don't have junior, senior lawyers doing this over and over. Um, so yeah, that, and again, the time suck for business owners. They, right, you, like you know, you know, when I've done probably each of these cases takes me I don't know, 10, 20 hours all in. Right, if you multiply that by my billable rate, it's you know, it's more expensive. You're buying the premium of making sure something that's been done, you know, optimized, right, right? and yep. and. It, so yeah, there's a premium. I, I have a buddy that jokes, and or he, he's always asking me, "Why well, I've got this document model, this software that I can just push the buttons? Like, you know, why, why, you know, it, it, why, you, why are you charging so much?" What I said, <laughs> like I said, it's so much more than just. Even if you get a good document, it's the funding design, it's right. the being able to immediately respond uh, with answers, being able to simplify complex things like we've had during this call. And spit it out in a digestible, understandable format. It's the process. It's the back end instruction instruction manual and the front end memo. It's all of that. That's where the value is. And I'm, again, I'm, I'm going to tell my lawyers in about ten minutes. I'm going to talk about all this with them because lawyers don't do this, right? They don't right. do it. They, just do, they don't do it. Yeah, they're really paying you not for your time, but for your expertise, knowledge, best practices, all of that. Well, hey, I know we're running up against our our time limit. Uh, if somebody wants to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to reach out? LinkedIn, email, phone, you tell me. Emails, emails best. That's okay. What's that email? J Morrison at FRGA law.com. So Frazier, Ryan, Goldberg, Arnold, F R G A L A W dot com. And again, reach out, say, hey, here's my situation. Heard you on the podcast. And I've got, you know, pro forum process. I respond. Here's, here's all the materials. Here's where I think, you know, hop on a 45 minute zoom. My paralegal usually gathers some 10 minutes of information before that. We'll run the numbers on the fly. We'll look at the stuff on the fly and see if it makes sense. And I tell clients, Perfect. look, I, I make a good living. I say, if this doesn't work for you, I'm happy to talk myself out of a job and tell you it doesn't. But if it does, you know, let's get going because there's so much, there's no other industry that you can get thousand to one return. I mean, yeah, two hundred million dollars of estate taxes saved for less than a hundred grand. Um, yep. No other any good financial advisor knows to run to the estate attorney because that's where the, that's low hanging fruit. It's the best money you can spend, and and then sure. making sure we also make sure all your kids' inheritance protected from creditors, lawsuits, and divorce. Like that mm -hmm. may be more important than the tax savings. Making sure that. The kids' inheritance is well managed and protected, even if they have right. control over it. We can we can do it so it's all protected. So, 
a lot of there's a lot of benefits to what I do. I love what I do. It's and it's easy to sell because it's something I believe in. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of no, I, I get that. Well, yeah. Jonathan, I can't tell tell you how much I appreciate you taking time out of your day. I know you have a meeting to get to, so why don't we wrap it up? And again, thank you so much for your time and have a great day. Thank you. Wonderful. Appreciate it.